You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. Maximize your effectiveness in the changing global business environment with a postgraduate Oxford Diploma in Global Business. Taught in four short modules over a year, the program is designed to accelerate your career and increase your impact while minimizing the disruption to your work and family life. Learn alongside senior executives from around the world and develop a lifelong network. Visit the Oxford Diploma in Global Business website to find out more. So, Kimberly Closing, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to me about the topic of your most recent book, uh, Open, and you make the case for uh, open countries and open economies. And, um, you know, to get us into the subject area, um, you, you rightly argue that globalization has come under pressure from critics on the right and as well as from the left of the political spectrum. Um, what would you summarize as their main points of criticism and why do you think these points are wrong? Yes, so thank you so much for having me. It's great to talk to you about these topics. And in terms of their main points of criticism, I, I think they share a, a great skepticism of trade agreements um, and a particular concern that trade agreements have disadvantaged the United States or its workers, right? And that's a common theme that you'll see on kind of both sides of the political spectrum. Um, there's a, a sense, uh, particularly on the right, although a little bit on the left, that um, other countries have profited at our expense, right, at, at this notion that um, the agreements themselves were either unfair or other countries have been more strategic than we have in sort of pursuing the benefits from trade and thus, you know, we've been made poor as a result. Um, when it comes to issues around immigration or multinational corporations, there I think you see different types of skepticism on different sides of the political spectrum. So I, I would argue in the United States that those on the right are more skeptical of the benefits of immigration than those on the left, and you see much more sort of strident anti-immigrant views there. Although, you know, you will see occasional concerns, you know, raised by commentators on, on the left as well. Um, and when it comes to capital mobility, I would say that the positions are somewhat reversed in the sense that the left is more skeptical of international capital mobility, um, whereas the right seems more comfortable with that aspect of globalization. So it sort of depends on which issue you're looking at, but you do see sort of a, a, a tendency for those on the on the extremes of the spectrum to be quite skeptical of, of, of international markets. And uh, why do you think these arguments are wrong? Well, I think that um, they have a kernel of truth, which is that if you look at the experience of U.S. workers over the past few decades, it's quite clear that um, it's fallen short of expectations. So wage growth has been less than it was in the prior generation. Income inequality has increased regardless of which source you look at. Um, the only debate there is how much it's increased. Um, but that means that a lot of people feel left behind um, in today's economy. And certainly, international competition has played a role in that feeling, um, particularly on the trade side. I don't think there's much evidence, if any, that immigration has been responsible for this uh, low um, and disappointing uh, growth of worker wages. But, but when you look at trade, you do see heightened international competition may have played a role in some of workers' troubles. What I think is wrong about sort of blaming outsiders for these economic events is that there's really a lot of other things that are going on as well that are being completely swept under the rug when you do that. So just to give you a few examples, technological change is a really important force in our economy. And, and because technological change has been so dramatic, it's really shifted labor demand away from those who had lower skills or less education and towards those at sort of the top of the skill and education spectrum. So you see, as a result, um, that's been a big driver of income inequality. Um, but there are also other issues too, uh, the rising market power of companies relative to the market power, or sorry, the, the power in general, the bargaining power of workers. Uh, labor laws have, have become you know, less helpful to the bar to, in terms of strengthening the bargaining power of workers. Economic policy in the United States in particular has been 
sort of more geared towards providing tax cuts and regulatory relief than um, to sort of helping those in the middle class. So because we have all these different causal explanations, I think the danger of just sort of pinning it all on foreign trade or on foreigners in the, in the case of immigration is that one, you're kind of uh, addressing a storm that's coming from many directions by just focusing on one tiny part of it. And two, I think you also risk creating a lot of collateral damage when you pursue protectionism or immigration barriers as your solution. So in both cases, and I'd be happy to go into to more detail, I think when you when you do this, you actually harm some of the same people that you're trying to help. So trade barriers hurt the working class more than they help them. And similarly, Im immigration restrictions hurt the working class more than they help them. So it's sort of a wrong-headed response to say, OK, because this is part of the problem, we're going to focus on this. And then, by the way, we're just going to introduce a, a bunch of new labor market shocks. We're going to make the growth of the economy worse. You know, It's not clear that any of those solutions are really helping uh, the, the people. And uh, let's focus on trade for, uh, for, for a second, because there is, um, trade is very much in the political focus at the moment. I mean, not least uh, from the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis China, but also, you know, being based in Germany, uh, we feel like sometimes like China too, uh, yes. <laughs> because of the trade surplus. And I oh, think there, right. are, there are valid criticism, you know, also levered against Germany for running, uh, you know, sustained trade surpluses, which automatically lead to indebtedness in other countries. So where would you make the economic argument? So what really is our valid points in criticizing persistent trade imbalances in general terms, not bilaterally? And what is and where would you make the distinction between sort of a political argument that goes beyond what is a valid economic criticism? Yeah, so um, that's a really interesting point. And I think I really wish that uh, U.S. policymakers and those in other countries better understood the relationship between macroeconomic factors and these trade imbalances. So let's take the German case. So Germany has run a, a large current account surplus for many years. Um, and you might say, well, that's disadvantaged the other countries that are on the flip side of that and running a deficit. But, but one thing you need to remember is this: the root sources of those surpluses and deficits. So Every country that runs a surplus, including Germany and in the years when China does it, China, um, they're all saving you know, more as a society than they're investing. And another way of, of stating that is that they're consuming less than they're producing, right? And because of those macroeconomic facts, um, if you consume less than you produce, the rest shows up as a trade surplus. Uh, and on the flip side of that, you've got countries like the United States and, and Mexico, um, both of whom run global um, current account deficits because they don't save as much as they invest. Or another way of saying that is they're spending more than they're earning, right? So if you really want to get to the root uh, causes of those deficits and surpluses, you have to address these big macroeconomic things. Why do country, some countries save more than others? And why do some countries spend more than others? Um, and if you instead sort of willy-nilly erect trade barriers, which the United States seems to think is the proper response to this right now, um, you aren't going to actually change or improve your current account deficit. And in the U.S. case, we haven't seen improvements resulting from all of these trade barriers that we've kind of haphazardly erected against both, uh, you know, ad adversaries and allies, right? Um, but you haven't seen any uh, improvement in the current account deficit, and that's because there hasn't been any improvement in our macroeconomic tendency to spend more than we earn. So if you if you look at the government budget side of this, in the United States, the, the government budget deficit is in excess of a trillion dollars. If you compare that to the German um, near obsession with budget balance and, and fiscal propriety, right? You know, I mean, that itself can explain a large amount of the, the differences in the current account balances, countries that, that are very uh, proper with respect to managing their budget and don't let things go into deficit are gonna see um, a, a much bigger um, current accounts surplus or a smaller deficit than those that are, are spending, right? And there's a private sector analog to this too, right? Um, individuals' decisions about how much to save for their retirement, um, 
and companies' decisions about how much money to set aside, those will also contribute to this story. So unless you can change one of those fundamental dynamics, in the U.S. case, unless you can get households to save more or companies to save more or the government to stop running huge deficits, you're going to automatically have a trade deficit no matter what trade policies you put up. Um, and in countries like Germany, uh, unless they can get people to spend more, either in the household sector or the government sector relative to what they're producing, Germany's going to run a surplus. And that's just kind of a fact that it would be nice if the, the political sphere could understand those facts so that they could focus on the root causes of those imbalances rather than assuming it's some sort of uh, chess game where you've been outwitted by the countries that have the surpluses in, in trade policy, because that's not, that's not what's going on. Yeah, I mean, in Germany, the political debate is going in that direction because we at the same time have a net depreciating public capital stock, right? So yes. it, it, it's clearly the lack of public investment uh, uh, that is to blame and that black zero and the debt break and all these uh, economically quite nonsensical uh, uh, fiscal instruments. Uh, so yeah. they're, they're under more sustained attack now. So, But at the yeah. same time, obviously, there's a key difference uh, to the United States. And that was, I think, one of the valid criticisms. The US obviously has its own currency it can just print uh, to pay for that deficit. Whereas in the Eurozone, uh, uh, if there is a, a, even a bilateral uh, trade deficit, uh, it is in a currency that you don't control. Yeah, the Eurozone is, it raises its own vexing macroeconomic problems. And I am just teaching a class this semester where we've talked about some of the downsides of that, um, because you're basically taking economies that aren't in sync and you're requiring them to use the same currency. And so you'll have situations where, where some countries will have unemployment in excess of 20% for five years in a row. And that's happened in, in uh, I believe, in both Spain and Greece. Um, and, and in the Spanish situation, before that happened, there wasn't even that large of a debt burden before they, they got hit with this shock. Um, and then you'll have other countries like Germany that um, you know may wish that monetary policy was actually tighter rather than looser, right? So you, you um, by adopting the euro, it comes with a lot of microeconomic and, and uh, symbolic benefits, but it comes with a big macro downside, which is that it's not clear that Europe is, you know, an optimal area to share one currency. I think. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah. the theory is quite tricky of optimal currency areas. I mean, in the UK, yeah. where I used to live, I mean, the conditions in the industrialized northern England are also very different from London. So, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, mean in, the, in the UK case, though, is that people are, are all speak English can move easily across the parts of the UK. And there's a federal UK government that, you know, spreads uh, a fair amount of fiscal, you know, um, transfers across different parts of the UK, whereas the EU budget is really tiny compared to the European economy. And labor mobility, while it's positive, um, it's, it's much less uh, across European countries than it is within European countries. So that's both of those are considerations that, you know, might make one think twice <laughs> uh, yeah, about the Euro project a little bit. The, yeah. the, the offsetting factors are not as strong as they are in, 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 in other countries. And, but at the same time, um, I think, you know, one of the elements you have to bear in mind when you're looking at sort of trade surpluses and the, uh, the uh, offsetting, well, the flip side, the capital account, is that if you run this persistently year after year after year, you would expect your, your foreign assets to actually increase to a similar tune. Whereas in uh, not very not very many people look at this in Germany, but it doesn't seem to be the case <laughs> in Germany that you know the foreign asset position doesn't doesn't increase as quickly uh, as the the outflowing capital would suggest. Yeah. So uh, that that suggests that either there's something wrong with the with the accounting and the statistics, or a lot of this investment that money flows outside is being sunk in bad investments. Yeah, yeah, there's a similar puzzle in the United States where for a period of many years we've been running current account deficits without the net international investment position deteriorating as much as you would think. Um, and it, you know, some of this is exchange rate fluctuations because in years where the dollar is, is um, stronger, um, then it deteriorates more, ironically. And then in years when the dollar is weak, uh, you know, the uh, it deteriorates less. So some of that that can be explained by changes in the exchange rate, but also there's this question of how that um, money is invested. So if U.S. Um, earnings abroad are, are earning more than foreign earnings in the United States are, you know, that will prevent our net international investment position from deteriorating as fast as you would think. And that's been the general pattern. I, I personally suspect that some of that is actually tax avoidance um, in the sense that our... 
one of the reasons our earnings offshore look so good is because they're not really as high as we say they are. But we prefer, you know, companies might prefer to have the money booked off, offshore in a low tax rate country than have it um, booked in the United States. So that can that can influence the international accounting quite a bit too, tax incentives. Yeah, we come to multinational companies in a, in, in a minute because that's obviously one of the big focal points in terms of, you know, questioning the fairness of globalization. But uh, yeah. in, in the meantime, let's have a quick uh, chat about migration and the migration issue. And um, obviously, that's also a very high, uh, politically highly charged discussion in Europe. I mean, we just yeah. had the UK yeah. elections and I moved back to Germany because of Brexit. <laughs> and yeah. so yeah. Uh, uh, Truly, what, yeah. what, what do you think are the economic effects on, of, of migration? And so is there a case to be made or is it just simply protectionism? But at the same time, obviously, for political purposes, it is not just the economic case. So how would you yeah. incorporate the what's, what is often called the cultural elements um, yeah. uh, into, into your economic analysis and your plea for remaining open? Yes, absolutely. Those are excellent questions. And I, I think one thing to um, be aware of is that in terms of immigrant flows is sort of the contrast between um, the European experience of late and uh, the U.S. experience and in the sense that if you look at the sort of share of immigrants relative to the stock of the population in many European countries, it's actually higher than in the United States right now. Um, but if you go back a few decades, that wasn't case. So the United States has kind of a longer history of, of higher immigration than some European countries do. But what's really happened in, in many European countries is the stock of immigration has changed very quickly. Um, and I think because of that, you know, that has um, political ramifications for how people adjust to these new flows of migrants, um, which may be, I think, more political than economic. Um, so uh, in terms of the economic case, uh, I think it's very clear cut in the literature that migrants are, in general, a net benefit to the societies that receive them. And this is true not just for the highly educated migrants, although it's especially true for them because they come with a lot of, um, you know, know-how and, um, you know, expertise that might complement the domestic population. So, for instance, in the United States, you see a lot of computer scientists and engineers who are international migrants, and, and those are particularly valuable. But but even the low-skilled migrants, if you look at um, refugees, for instance, in the United States, um, they're, they're more likely to found businesses. Uh, there's uh, evidence that within 10 years, they're actually paying more to the government in taxes than they're receiving in benefits. You know, so there's a lot of of uh, economic merit um, to to being open to the to the migrants of the world, both in sort of economic growth terms and uh, you know in, in other terms. Uh, one thing that people worry about on the economic side is is wage effects. So you might think, well, if there's more labor supply, period, <laughs> that should drive down wages, right? If you even have one economics class, you you know that increased supply drives down the price, and that's true for labor too. But one thing that people often miss um, when they think through the theoretical implications of more um, immigrants is, is they miss the fact that those immigrants are also disproportionately likely to create labor demand. So, and this is true in Germany as well. If you look at small business formation and the rate at which um, different groups found new businesses, uh, migrants found more new small businesses than do native born Germans. And, and the same is true um, in the United States. So when you think about these uh, new flows of people, they're not just creating labor supply, they're also creating labor demand because when you start a business, you're going to hire people and the, you're going to create economic activity too. Um, and I think that's part of why the economic case for immigration is, is so strong, is that there's a lot of um, extra entrepreneurship and, and job creation that comes with these groups of people. In terms of the politics, I think there are, there are several issues. There's sort of the wage fear, right, which I think we can dispel with research, but there's also big cultural concerns about um, what makes a country truly a country, right? Like, do we do we need to have a common cultural identity? Um, is there is it the case that the things that make Germany uh, German will be somehow uh, diluted or less powerful if we add new cultural elements to the mix? Um, I have looked a little bit at the, at the literature in the United States on this question, and it seems quite clear that some of the common fears are completely hypothetical, right? If you look at crime rates, for instance, um, which is one thing that people worry about, um, the crime rates of, of 
uh, immigrants tend to be lower than the, the crime rates of uh, native born Americans. And, and the same is true for um, even the undocumented immigrants. They don't tend to have a higher crime rate than, than people who were in the United States from birth. Um, when we look at institutional strength, you don't see uh, correlations between measures of institutional strength and, and immigrant uh, density. Uh, so there's no evidence that institutional strength is being eroded by greater immigrant groups. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think there are these, um, you know, important, powerful political forces that are sort of resistant to, um, you know, difference, right? And, and so that's that's one you know, political hurdle in this whole story. I and mean, when I write the chapter on immigration in, in my book, it's an extremely positive story on the economic front. You know, and then when, when you when people read it, they're like, well, why then would people resist migrants? You know, and, the, and then the answer often comes down to some of these um, cultural fears. But, but one uh, fact that I take solace from in the United States is if you sort of look at where immigrants are, the distribution, it's its far from even. They, they settle in certain regions and certain cities uh, rather than spreading themselves out evenly throughout the country. And if you look at polling data about whether immigrants make the country stronger or actually harm us culturally or in other ways, right, the polling data have the most favorable impressions of immigrants in the places where the immigrants are. And, and these are polls that are not polling the, the immigrants entirely, but just but focusing on the, on the population as a whole. So I think the places where there's a lot of immigrant skepticism in the United States, you look at the immigrant density in those places, and there's almost no immigrants to be skeptical of, right? Like so, so in a way, I, I find that encouraging because it sort of implies that um, more information might help, right? Like if people got to know a handful of immigrants, they might actually find that you know that, that some of their fears were were unfounded. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, we, we were we were hoping this this too, to be honest, but because we have the same survey evidence in in Europe, yeah. uh, but yeah. it turns out to be the case that uh, you know, for most interpretations, these areas where there are very few immigrants and I have this quite negative view, they have it because they they definitely don't want to change it uh, in a way like this. So they look at these yeah. multicultural cities, they look at places like Berlin and and other places and said. Yeah, good. It's it's good if you want to be like this, but we really don't want to be like this. So, it is unfortunately, I think, the evidence here now points is not just the the lack of personal experience, which was also the hope here, but is literally uh, the rejection of that very concept of yeah. these of these multicultural places, and also what well, I mean, we looked at, at evidence, uh, for instance, in Germany. It tends to be the case that you have to, I think, make a distinction between what type of immigration uh, you're talking about. So we have non-EU immigration, uh, which tends to be people highly skilled and they're looking for work in uh, in places that they have jobs. So that, that seems to be very uncontentious. Uh, the same actually applies, at least in Germany, which was not the case in the UK, uh, to inner European uh, freedom of movement. So as, as you know, in the UK, it's sort of Eastern European immigration was a, a bone of contention. Uh, in Germany, that is not a bone of contention, not yet, at, at least. But, it, it, you know, the UK example shows it can become a bone of contention. Uh, but in Germany, for instance, the evidence was uh, it was about refugees and asylum seekers. And the, the research uh, seems to suggest, uh, you know, looking at uh, experiences of previous um, you know, intakes of, of uh, asylum seekers, especially in the mid-90s when uh, Yugoslavia uh, collapsed, uh, was that they are, in, in general, much harder to integrate into the labor market. I think from the top of my head, the research suggests that after five years, about 50% are integrated in the labor market, which also suggests the other half is very, very difficult to integrate in any sort of labor market. So um, it, it seems to suggest that you, you have to have Different, uh, different, more specific solutions to specific types of immigration uh, than just talking about immigrants in general. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true, and I think there's also a policy levers that one can pull to make it easier for refugees to get work. I mean, in, in some countries in, in Europe, and I, I think Denmark is an example, they actually prevent uh, people from getting jobs for a while because there's an emphasis on uh, various types of education and things that... that that they view that uh, refugees should have prior to sort of entering the labor market. I, I, my uh, instinct on that, and I am not a, a student of this area, so I, sh I should point out that I don't do research on this question, but 
Um, my instinct on that is that a quicker um, integration into the labor market might might ultimately pay better dividends. So to be more permissive about immediate um, access to labor markets when people arrive, I think actually makes them uh, makes their path to sort of becoming swiftly integrated in society a lot easier when they've got a purpose and a job to go to and things to do and resources and you know like and. And also might take away some of the resentment that a, a large fiscal burden that these uh, groups can have if they're using a lot of resources to get educational and housing and food assistance. Uh, it might be better if they were, you know, doing what they want to do in many cases, which is working right away to raise those sorts of, of resources. Um, and getting back to this question about different regions, I, I do think that one aspect of this, so some of this is, is uh, might have to do with ideology, right? But but some of it, I think, does have to do with the fact that there are regions in, in all countries, including England and Germany and the United States, where um, economic shocks and um, displacement and, and uh, adjustment issues are, are much larger than others, right? And so you get these sort of regions and spots in the country that are left behind economically, that are very geographically concentrated in their pain, um, and I think that those are the areas that are like especially likely to be resentful of the idea of immigrants, even if there aren't any immigrants in those, you know, kind of depressed regions. Um, but that does suggest the importance of having, you know, policy levers that address those regions directly, um, making public investments, for instance, in, in housing and infrastructure, or making uh, helping facilitate partnerships between higher education and uh, business in those regions. You know, I think I think all um, countries could stand to be a little more cognizant of, of uh, geographic inequalities that are that are persistent due to the shocks showing up in some places, but but not in others. Because um, because I think those kinds of left behind regions that can breed resentment that shows up in all sorts of strange and nationalistic ways. Yeah, I mean, inequality is a very good notion as a segue into, <laughs> into the yeah. next topical area. Uh, even though you made a, a quite compelling case for uh, the economic um, reasons for, for openness, I think we all agree that the way globalization has been handled politically and regulated uh, has led to a lot of grievances and justified grievances, including inequalities, and uh, not just economic inequalities, but also, uh, you know, the, the idea that there is not equally fair treatment. And especially if you look at uh, the way how multinational corporations have been able to um, you know, play uh, regulatory arbitrage and have, have, have been able to, uh, you know, reap the benefits of, of uh, a lack of collective action on the global level, whereas, uh, you know, locally confined subjects such as the local taxpayers uh, have been burdened with more and more of the, uh, of the revenue side of public finances. Uh, you can see where a lot of these grievances uh, come from. And, and one of the research area I know is also is exactly the taxation yeah. of, uh, of multinational uh, corporations. And interestingly, we did a podcast a few months ago with a German expert on, on, on taxation. There are interesting things underway, but effective minimum taxation and, and these sort of things. So how would you uh, say uh, should policymakers treat multinational corporations differently to make uh, make it clear to the population that you know it's not them who suffer uh, the negative consequences of globalization but you know the benefits as well as the downsides are equally shared yeah I, that is a wonderful question and i guess if you had to just make one punchline actually from this entire book, it would be that tax policy is a really effective lever for dealing with almost every problem identified in the book and a far more effective lever than protectionism or barriers. Um, so let me talk about what I mean by that. I, I think tax policy has a role to play here both in um, helping the wage growth of those at the bottom that has been too slow. So for instance, you can expand uh, the earned income tax credit is what we have in the United States, which basically creates a, a negative tax rate for low income workers. You can expand negative tax rates for those at the bottom to try to make sure that the, the bottom half of the population is seeing the prosperity that's shared in the economy. Um, but another thing that we need to be really um, cognizant of, and it's, it's definitely a global issue, is the um, issue of taxing capital, right? Um, because we see that more and more of GDP is in the hands of capital rather than labor, and that's true in a, a lot of different countries. We see that a lot of the income of those at the very top takes the form of capital. Um, and, and when I say taxing capital, I'm not just talking about 
personal income, like dividends and capital gains, which have, have in many countries seen big tax cuts, uh, but also the income before it even reaches people when it's in, in the company form, right? So if we take multinational companies, which is now getting to your question, um, that's kind of our first um, take at uh, taxing a lot of global capital, right? As it starts off in these companies, it's earned currently. It would be ideal if that income were taxed. Um, and particularly when we recognize that a lot of the corporate tax base is really falling not on the normal return to capital, but on some excess ca return to capital or excess profits. And, and if we think about uh, taxing those forms of capital, it's particularly efficient relative to the normal return to capital. So if there's a company like uh, uh, Alphabet, um, which is Google or um, Apple, or um, you know, you could take uh, your favorites. Um, and, and we see that year after year, they're earning more profit than we consider really the normal return to capital. But we're also sort of facilitating them avoiding tax on that profit by setting up rules that let them shift the income to tax havens and not pay their fair share of you know the civilized society costs of running a government, right? You know, then that that. It has a lot of really negative consequences. It means there's less revenue for the state to do the things it wants to do. It means that more of the tax burden is shifted onto labor and away from capital because you do need some money to run the state. So then you're raising things like the value added tax or the or the labor income tax as a response. Uh, and so then you get the the, the top one percent or the top ten percent who may be doing really well, actually seeing that a lot of their income can be almost completely escaped tax if earned in capital form. Uh, whereas those who are just kind of seeing more stagnant wages are often paying, if anything, higher taxes than they were in, in prior decades. So with respect to multinationals, I think this is entirely 100% uh, a matter of, of political will. There are many things that countries can do, even on a unilateral basis, that don't require international collective action that could be quite effective in clamping down on, on tax avoidance. But there are also these nice... Um, what are these things? Okay, so for instance, a minimum tax. Um, so the U.S. now has this sort of um, very minor minimum tax in the sense that it's uh, set at half the new U.S. rate. The new U.S. rate is 21%, so this is a 10.5%. And it's a global minimum tax so that the companies can basically um, take their global income, average the sort of extra payments to countries like Germany against the zero payments to countries like Bermuda, and then sort of calculate what would be due to the U.S. government on, on top of that. Um, and so that that's a starter minimum tax, I would say, but I think it could be strengthened in a number of ways. For instance, it would be much more effective if it were done on a per country basis so that every dollar you earned in Bermuda, you had to pay minimum tax immediately. That would be a much more effective way to protect the tax base because then you would be directly discouraging basically any income in a country below the minimum tax rate. Whereas with this global averaging feature, it has this strange um, uh, tendency to encourage kind of all foreign income relative to domestic income, because you can basically average across the foreign income sources to get to half the U.S. rate <laughs> rather than paying the normal U.S. rate. So I think per country implementation of that would be better. I also think um, it could be a much higher rate. There's no reason to have it be 10.5%. Um, the, the cool thing about a minimum tax is if, if the United States did one unilaterally or if the EU uh, or, or some fraction of EU members decided to do that, um, you know, it has positive spillover effects to other countries, too, because if U.S. companies now realize that, OK, every dollar they earn in Bermuda is going to be taxed at a higher rate than zero, right, then that's going to cause them to do both less shifting from the United States to Bermuda, but also less shifting from Germany to Bermuda. And there's a lot of uh, U.S. multinational companies who shift um, out of all the higher tax uh, countries and into places like Bermuda that have a have a zero tax rate. Um, and, and it's not just U.S. multinationals. Foreign multinationals do this too. I think U.S. multinationals get in the news more because um, they they they're often kind of household names in, in some sectors that people pay a lot of attention to. But I'm you know I'm quite confident that this isn't an entirely U.S. problem. That you know that any any company that's very large and profitable. Um, is kind of doing what they can to minimize their global tax burdens. And so if France has a minimum tax, uh, that would also have spillover effects that helps the US, right? Because now French multinationals won't be able to have an easy, such an easy time shifting income out of the United States to, to island jurisdictions. So I think minimum taxes are very promising. I also think that um, in the long run, I think looking at, at solutions like formula apportionment, where you basically ask companies, like, how much did you earn globally? And then you assign some fraction of that 
profit to the different tax bases based on a simple formula of where their customers were destined and where their employees are, right? That would take a lot of the mystery out of calculating international tax burdens. Uh, that approach does require more international cooperation, or you can end up with double taxation or double non-taxation. But the EU has suggested something similar uh, for within the EU for a common consolidated corporate tax base, which is formula-based system. Um, and if you extended that beyond the EU, for instance, um, you know, even if the EU did it themselves, just didn't include anybody else in this international cooperation, it was like, okay, we're going to tax based on a formula, and it's going to be half destination of sales and half employment, let's say, and we'll, we'll split the employment half between employees and payroll. You know, if they do that, then suddenly, actually, the United States and many other countries would have an incentive to join that same system, one for administrative ease, but more importantly, um, the EU would look to U.S. companies like a giant Bermuda in the sense that if they start shifting money anywhere into the EU, right, it won't change the EU tax liability because that's just based on the formula, but it would reduce the U.S. tax liability or the Japanese tax liability or what have you, right? So other countries' tax bases would start to erode relative to the adopting countries, and so that could actually really lead to a dynamic to kind of get everybody to adopt uh, a formulary system. I um, mean, that may sound a little fantastical, but the, the OECD right now is um, considering um, several proposals for digital taxation that have formulary elements. Um, I do think that um, there is a, some risk here that if you do sort of a hybrid system, which has some formula elements and some of the old system elements, you just end up with Byzantine, absolutely mind-numbing complexity. And, and this is already an area that's really complicated. So um, if the formulary solution is adopted, I think it should be simple and it should replace the, the prior system rather than be an add-on. Um, but in the meantime, while we're waiting for that sort of more uh, uh, systematic systematic reform, I think in the meantime, minimum taxes could do a lot of good to sort of give give uh, some breathing room while we're working on this international cooperation. Yeah, I mean, and that's the that's the uh, the idea that I gather here from Berlin is that minimum taxation is a good starting point, and we'll try to do something on the OECD level, which yeah. would be the preferred arena. If yeah, that yeah. if that fails to produce something, we'll we'll think about it in the European Union framework, and uh, and yeah. obviously the European Union will now have to deal with a, a former member state that might um, uh, seek to differentiate itself with a policy agenda, right? So right, right. we'll have to and see. We'll have to deal with the fact that they're they're home to a few of the marquee havens here, right? Like so, both um, the Netherlands and Luxembourg uh, have a lot of haven characteristics, and so if this is done on a, a sort of unanimity basis, it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, and Ireland as well. Well, obviously, so uh, oh, right what, in Ireland. Sorry, yeah, I knew there was a third. If somehow it slipped my mind for a second. Was it the, the the double Irish Dutch sandwich or whatever it's called? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was one of the the uh, fun techniques of the past. I think I believe they've shut that particular one down, but it sort of reared its head in a slightly different form. Um, and that's one issue with some of these tax arrangements is it it can feel like you know the accountants and lawyers are always one step ahead of the governments if you just try to do it piecemeal. So the advantages of a minimum tax or eventually formulary, both of those are much less piecemeal solutions as opposed to just finding little things and trying to try to stop one hole in the dam and then, <laughs> then patch another one. You know, it's it's difficult. It's just a blanket solution. There's there's very little you can do get around it. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And uh, well, I mean, uh, and to come towards the end of it, we already talked for more than an, an half an hour. I mean, yeah. the uh, the subtitle of your book is the progressive case uh, yeah. for free trade, immigration, and, um, and 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 global capital. And uh, let me finish with the same type of question that I always ask uh, uh, towards the end. Um, if you think about uh, the topics that we've just talked about economically, but also politically, and if you were a policymaker and your idea is we need to stop populism, uh, uh, you know, gaining gaining even more ground than it already has, and we try to convince the people that you know staying open and uh, being open-minded about uh, globalization is the way forward. What would your top three priorities be as a policymaker? So where would you start? What would be number one, two, and three? One, two, and three. Of, yeah, so I mean, I guess I would say first about the title of, of the book. I mean, I do think the reason I call it a progressive case for uh, trade and immigration and capital is that I, I think that it's really important to put workers at the center of this conversation. So I think the very first thing to do is just sort of acknowledge and respond to the concerns of workers, but in a smart way. I mean, I think uh, 
progressives and those who want to sort of help the working class and, and the middle class really just need to be smart and effective in their in their approaches to this. We have a lot of really great policy tools that, that move money directly to people and that invest in things like, you know, infra infrastructure and education and science and technology. And those are really smart policies and ways to help. Um, and so I think the very first thing I would do is try to kind of put worker-centered, smart policies uh, together um, as on a large, bold scale, not just like you get you know $800 less in taxes, but no, we're going to give you like free community college in the United States, for instance, which isn't necessary in, in Germany. Um, but um, we're going to we're going to invest a lot in infrastructure and R and D, and we're going to make sure that your your tax um, subsidies uh, actually go up in a really substantial way if you're in the bottom half of the income distribution. So I think that can forestall some populism basically by making the, the working class, I think, more successful. A um, uh, second uh, big prior uh, policy priority that I think we all need to address is, is climate change. And, and ironically, or not ironically really, um, Pleasantly, I think one of the best tools for dealing with that is also a tax policy tool. So if you have a large carbon tax um, and, and you phase it in maybe at $5 a metric ton per year, um, but but you make it serious, you try to get all the way to the social marginal cost of carbon with this tax, then you're going to raise a, a lot of revenue while simultaneously really s uh, responding to the world's most dire problem um, in terms of environmental um, uh, policy, but also in terms perhaps more generally, right? Um, and you're doing this in a way that ultimately makes the tax system more efficient, right? Because you're discouraging something that's bad rather than labor or savings, right? Um, you're raising a lot of revenue, but you're raising a lot of revenue in a way that makes uh, the economy more efficient and that responds to this really uh, big threat uh, facing the planet. So I think that can be combined with the policies that I just talked about with the workers to um, effectively make sure that that those in the bottom aren't unduly suffering from higher energy prices, right? We saw with the yellow vest protests and, and in other countries as well that it's not that popular to increase taxes on energy. But if you combine that with lower taxes for uh, and, but, you know, dramatically lower taxes for those who haven't seen their wages go up lately, you can actually end up making almost everybody better off while solving a, a really big problem. Um, and the third area I, I would emphasize, I think, um, and it's hard to pick just three, so maybe I'll just cheat and take four. Um, but both immigration reform and multinational tax reform, I think, are important. Multinational tax reform and capital reform more generally, capital tax reform more generally, such that we can share the burden of all of these public investments we want to make a little more evenly. And we've already talked about that one. Um, but immigration reform, I think, is, is really important, too. I think... Um, in the, and that's going to vary a lot by country. I think in the United States, what we need is sort of a path to citizenship for the undocumented. We also need more immigrants, frankly, of the, the high skill type to deal with labor shortages in those areas. Um, and, and we need to sort of reform some of the H-1B and higher skilled visas to encourage that. And, and I would also argue just plain old more immigrants in general would be helpful to deal with some of the demographic fiscal uh, burdens that, that the United States and Germany and Italy and many other countries are also facing with this aging of the population. Um, but that needs to be handled well in, in a way that generates buy-in, right? So I think finding out what it is that those left behind regions, you know, find so threatening about immigrants and, and addressing that, right? Um, and it might take things like public relations campaigns as well to sort of like uh, reassure people that this is ultimately good for the country and managing the flow such that it's not, you know, a really shocking increase in one year, uh, making things, you know, smooth. I, so those would be the big priorities I, I would put at the top of the agenda. Great. Kimberly Closing, thank you very much indeed again for taking the time. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we have uh, time for yeah. today. But look, I mean, that's going to be an issue <laughs> or these issues are going to be an agenda for quite some time. So uh, yeah. we might have uh, the opportunity to revisit at a, at a later stage. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time. <laughs>